Good afternoon and welcome to our latest 1AD Google Hangout. Uh, my name is Kevin Barefoot. Today we're going to be talking with Lynn Simon, who is an adjunct professor of law at Duke University as well as the University of San Diego. Lynn recently wrote an article uh, in the Sports Business Journal titled, The Demise of NCAA Amateurism is Greatly Overstated where he outlines his thinking uh, that football and basketball players will not soon command market salaries as a result of the O'Bannon antitrust victory as well as other pending litigation facing the NCAA. So Lynn's here to talk with us today uh, and share his insights and opinions. I'd like to welcome Lynn. How are you doing today, sir? Very good. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. We appreciate you joining. I'm, I'm coming to you from uh, North Carolina, which got four inches of snow last night, which means that you know the entire state is on lockdown. You're you're out in uh, sunny San Diego, so no worries of winter weather your way, huh? No, people are complaining here that it's a 59 or 60 sometimes in the morning. <laughs> I feel for you. That's rough out there. That's rough. Well, you know, just this morning, Lynn, I was reading uh, an article about the Division One Leadership Council and the challenges created by the evolving NCAA landscape. And Mark LaBarbera, the athletic director at Valparaiso in the article said, quote, how are we going to operate in an environment that is more and more dictated by legal and court rulings than it's ever been in the past? You know, that's where you're going to see a lot of energy go, end quote. Uh, and that's what today's Hangout is all about. With an eye towards proactive engagement of these issues, uh, we have invited Lynn to talk about a couple of things. Number one, his analysis of the O'Bannon case uh, and, and what's likely to take place in the coming months and year. Uh, and then number two, ideas and considerations of how college athletic leaders can shape contingency plans for your department. So we have a list of questions and topics we're going to be talking about with Lynn today. Uh, but for those who are uh, uh, viewing the, the Hangout, you uh, have the opportunity to type in questions using the Q&A app in the Google Hangout uh, toolbar. And you can type in questions that we'll see and we'll ask Lynn during the course of the conversation. So let, let's start the conversation with a brief introduction. Lynn, tell us about your professional background and connection to college athletics. Okay, well, my professional background is that I'm a full-time lawyer and a part-time law professor. I teach sports and the law at the University of San Diego, and once in a while I go back to Duke and uh, teach there, either sports and the law or another course I teach called Complex Civil Litigation. I spend most of my time in litigation involving antitrust law, securities law, consumer fraud, uh, not involving sports, maybe 90% non-sports and 10% sports, but I've represented uh, the Major League Baseball, operation, represented the San Diego Padres, represented a few individual athletes, sued the NFL, sued the NBA, and sued the NCAA. Those of you who know the law case, um, restricted earnings coaches, that was my law firm's case, although once we got it kicked off, my partners handled, handled the case pretty much. I'm a college sports fan. I follow it pretty closely, and being an antitrust lawyer and a professor of sports law, I follow the... Uh, uh, the events, uh, new cases, new decisions, new challenges in college sports pretty closely. Well, we really like the SBJ piece, and I think, you know, O'Bannon has stretched over such a long period of time that I think folks are, are almost inundated with and, and, and probably a little bit overwhelmed with so many different, you know, angles and opinions and, and, and hypotheticals. And so we wanted to have you on today to try to cut through some of that and really get down to, you know, uh, again, what we, th what we think is going to happen and then how ADs can react. So I think most of our attendees are familiar with the O'Bannon lawsuit. You know, last summer the plaintiffs won the initial hearing. Judge Wilkin ruled that the NCAA could not prevent athletes from earning money on the use of their names and images in video games and TV broadcast. Um, bring our audience up to speed quickly and just tell us where we're at now with O'Bannon and, and what are the next milestones in the appeals process because it's on appeal right now. Sure. Well, the original case involved intellectual property rights. Uh, do the players were... It started. It, it morphed several times. It started with former players, then included current players, um, and it started with video games, and then it included broadcasts and rebroadcasts and highlight reels. So it got bigger and bigger and bigger. But if you take the whole the whole ball of wax, the the allegation was that there was uh, an antitrust violation because the NCAA schools prohibit because the NCAA the organization prohibited the member schools from offering their athletes any compensation for their intellectual property rights. 
And the NCAA defended the case basically on the basis that there were no such intellectual property rights. That is that you know, Jaleel Okafor does not have a right to be paid for his name and likeness appearing on a broadcast on ESPN, even if money is flowing to the NCAA or to Duke University. Uh, although video games might come out differently, and video games are now out of this case because the NCAA has announced they're not doing any more uh, of the video games they used to do. So the case is now really more about broadcasts and rebroadcasts. So there were two issues. One was, do the players have any rights? And the second is, uh, is the NCAA permitted in enforcing its view of amateurism to prohibit the schools from providing any compensation for those rights? So a two-piece analysis. And the initial ruling, the initial ruling went in the favor of the plaintiffs, right? And so, ruling, right. The initial ruling went in the favor of the plaintiffs. Judge Wilkin said, first of all, they have rights, and those rights are worth something. And then she said that, that the only reason for the schools to agree on how much they should pay, rather than each make their own decisions, was their view of amateurism. And her view was amateurism was real, amateurism counted for something, but the players would not become professionals, would not violate a, a fair understanding of amateurism rules if they were paid the full cost of attendance, point one, and if they were paid up to $5,000 held in trust, uh, paid to them after they graduated or left school. Now, if you think about that, Kevin, those are two really different things because the full cost of attendance is something that it appears that at least the big five conferences are pretty much ready to deal with right now, mm -hmm. whereas 5000 bucks a year uh, is something I don't think most of the people who are watching this who work for a university are either enthusiastic about paying or consider part of the concept of amateurism. Sure. So, so given that the ruling... ruling has, so the ruling has two very big and different pieces in it, the way it came out. Absolutely. And, and so, so where are we today? We, what are the next kind of milestones in the case, and what's going to be happening over the, in the coming months? Okay, well, the, the, uh, the NCAA has appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. This case was decided in a federal district court in San Francisco. So the appeal goes to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, headquartered in California, covering the western ten states or so. It'll be heard by three judges and it will be heard on uh, St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, coming right up just a few weeks from now. There will be an oral argument. It lasts about an hour. Uh, I think it's available online, Kevin. I should have checked for your audience. I'm not sure, but, I mean, five years ago, you could have seen this by flying to San Francisco and sitting in a room no other way, but the world is changing, and I believe it's available online. But there will be a one-hour, I'm sorry, half-an-hour oral argument, 15 minutes per side, and... Um, the court will then issue a written opinion when it's good and ready to, which could be in a month, which would be very fast, and could be six months, which would be a little slow. The court also knows that the um, ruling goes into effect, I believe, right around Labor Day, the time the students come back to school for the next academic year. So the court will want to try to rule before then and resolve any transitional, short-term transitional problems at the time it resolves the case. So we're looking like a we're looking like a spring summer decision on the appeal and 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 the next question is really why we brought you in here uh, one of the primary reasons we wanted to, you to weigh in how likely is O'Bannon to survive on appeal and why? Well, uh, it's very dangerous to predict what courts are going to do, especially when there's more than one issue before the court. But let, let me give it a try. Uh, the big win possibility for the NCAA is for the court to rule that the players actually have no intellectual property rights on broadcasts. Remember, this case is not a, a square-on challenge to amateurism. It's a challenge to amateurism uh, in the context of intellectual property rights. And the court has in front of it not only the briefs of the NCAA and the O'Bannon plaintiffs, but briefs from Hollywood and the television world and other people, what's called amicus briefs, friends of the court, arguing for and against the concept that, that a current player at an NCAA university has a right to be paid for appearing on a regular season or postseason basketball game. If the court says they have no rights, then it can't be much wrong with not paying them for the rights they don't have. 
and that would be scenario one, big win for the NCAA. Likely, uh, maybe not 50% likely, but, but could happen, not an outside chance. So you have to give that some, some points on your 100-point scale. Okay. If that issue comes out the other way, and the court says that the players have enough of a shot at rights that they should have been paid something to relinquish or waive those rights or clear those rights, and people do often pay at least modest amounts of money for rights that are in doubt, um, then the court has to decide the amateurism issue in, the, in this context, and it has to decide whether the NCAA would, be, would have been within its power back before autonomy, before the Big Five, had its own governance structure, and before the events we all know about of the last few months, would the NCAA have been within its rights uh, in, in enforcing its concept of amateurism to refuse to, ally, to refuse to allow full cost of attendance scholarships? I think that's a tough sell for the NCAA. I think full cost of attendance sounds quite logical, and I think prohibiting full cost of attendance doesn't sound like a rational approach to distinguishing amateurs from pros. So that piece, I think, the O'Bannon people have the better side of it. When you get to the IP rights, 5000 bucks a player per year put in trust, now you have a judge going pretty far off the uh, usual judge's reservation and sort of becoming the commissioner of the NCAA, and I think the court will have a lot of trouble with with what she did. I mean, why 5,000? Why not 2,000? Why not 15,000? And why anything? Isn't, isn't this pay for play? And if it's pay for play, isn't it prohibited by amateurism? And isn't the NCAA entitled to essentially define its game? Just as Little League Baseball can determine that its game is for kids up to 10 years old, then why can't the NCAA determine that its game is for amateurs? And pay for play is not amateurism. So I, I think it's a it's very likely that the five thousand dollars a year is going to die, or is going to be sent back to the lower court for further analysis, further refinement, or in some fashion get uh, upset in this appeal. Which which would be great news for the NCAA, obviously. And so to recap, there's two por portions of O'Bannon. There's the full cost of attendance, which schools have already shown a willingness to adopt. That's where O'Bannon's, the plaintiffs, uh, seem to have a stronger case. And then the second portion of it is the the IP rights, the $5,000 per year, which you feel uh, uh, have a significantly less or, or just a generally less percentage chance likelihood to to win here. Uh, can I pin you down? Do you, do you got a percentage on this? Is it 60-40 that the IP? Is it 80-20? What, what do you think? It, it, it's, it's hard to put a percentage on it, especially when you've got that first first issue I identified of whether there's IP rights at all. That's, that's kind of a difficult question of intellectual property law, First Amendment law. I, I wouldn't want to mess with it except to say that there's, there's a real chance the NCAA wins on that point. I don't Fair know, enough. twenty or thirty percent, and then there's another pretty good chance that they, you know, that they win on the on the on the back end of it on the IP. But um, I do think the full cost of attendance, if they had not caved already on full cost of attendance, I would think they'd be on the, you know, they'd be the underdog on that part of the case. So we got a question from the audience here that we'll we'll jump in and ask you here, Lynn. Is it correct that nothing in the O'Bannon ruling requires schools to make the 5K payment into a trust? So it's a question of requirement versus option. And then uh, kind of part two here. And is it correct that notwithstanding the significant Title IX issues, the NCAA can still restrict all sports besides football and men's basketball? Okay, those are great questions. Let, let me try to take them one at a time and remind me if I don't. Don't get yes. the second one completely. Question answered. one is requirement. I've got, I've, got, I've got it. I've got it. I just want to <laughs> not forget question two. So question number one is a great question, and it's a question that the people who write for the New York Times ought to ask because they get this wrong every single time they describe the O'Bannon case and sometimes when they describe uh, autonomy and, and new governance rules. There's not a word in the O'Bannon opinion that requires a university to do anything, period, flat out, straight on, zero. Uh, the O'Bannon opinion requires the NCAA to modify its amateurism definitions so that a university is free to pay up to full cost of attendance and up to $5,000 a year into trust. That's it. 
And if you know my alma mater, Duke University, or the nearest school to where I'm sitting, the University of San Diego, says too rich for our blood, we're not doing either. They're fully within their rights. The reason for that is it's an antitrust case, and antitrust is a, is a is a body of law that pro, that promotes competition. So think about it this way: I'm a basketball fan, so I, and you're in North Carolina. So imagine your kid is the best college basketball, high school basketball player in Winston-Salem, and he wants to go to Duke or North Carolina. Goes to see Roy Williams, and he says, I want to come here. Williams says, okay, full scholarship. And he says, what about full cost of attendance? Roy says, can't do that. Violates the NCAA rules. And Roy says, what about IP rights? Can't do that. It violates the NCAA rules. So he goes over to see Coach K, and he gets the same answers. And he says, Coach K, if you really want me, why don't you pay me the full cost of attendance? I'll come and star for you. He says, my hands are tied by the NCAA. That's the problem. The problem is not at Carolina. The problem is not at Duke. They're free to spend their money how they want. They could, they could decide to start offering half scholarships next year to everybody. I'm not sure they win too many games, but they could do it. But the problem was at the NCAA prohibiting the universities from offering up to full cost of attendance and offering up to um, $5,000. And Judge Wilkin thinks that's that's illegal. Now, you, you heard my view that the first half of that sounds illegal to me, the full cost of attendance, and the up to 5000 sounds a whole lot more defensible. But the answer to your, to your, uh, to your question is uh, each university is fully within its rights to make its own decisions, as I think it is, unless I'm misunderstanding something, in the new governance structure as well. I don't, I don't think any university is obliged to pay full cost of attendance for any of their athletes based on what the NCA has done. That's right. They have the they have the autonomy to, to make that choice. That's right. And then the, the second part of the question we got from the audience is, uh, and is is it correct that notwithstanding Title IX issues, the NCAA can still restrict all sports besides football, men's basketball? Yes and no. They can restrict all sports other than other than men's basketball and and uh, Division One football, um, as a matter of antitrust law, because that's all the O'Bannon plaintiffs bid off. They sued for the Division I basketball players and the Bowl Series football players and no one else. So if, you, if O'Bannon was the law, there was no appeal, and you ask me tomorrow, you know, what, can, can you limit scholarships to full cost of attendance for men's lacrosse, I would say, well, no court has told you you can't, but good luck, because if you do, somebody may sue you about that. We'll have a new case. But literally, the answer to the question is, yeah, that's correct. Only football and basketball. Do whatever you like. Now, when you, when you start your question with notwithstanding Title IX, of course, Judge Wilkin didn't even think about Title IX because there was nobody in there asking her for money for, for women's sports. So again, yeah, you could pay full cost of attendance for men's basketball and not pay it for women's basketball. And no one could say to you, you're violating the, Oban the O'Bannon rule. But they sure as heck could say to you, you're violating Title IX. And, so uh, probably that, are. That leads into a, a, another question. You know, if programs decide to, uh, at, uh, let, let's say that o O'Bannon does become law, uh, programs decide to begin paying cash up to 5K to football and basketball players. What should they do about Olympic sports? What are, What are their options there? It's a very hard question, uh, especially because of where it comes from. Uh, from the IP rights. Let, let me again break the question down. As a matter of public matter of public relations, uh, student relations, alumni relations, um, there's a first level question there of do you want to tell your your men's lacrosse players, your women's lacrosse players, your track and field folks that they're second class citizens and you're going to pay football and basketball players more? Uh, that's kind of an institutional decision based on both budgetary constraints and how you, you know, how, how that question sits in your craw as to where you're going with that. But there's a second level to it, which is I'm not sure Judge Wilkin comes out the same place if that case was about a woman's cross-country runner because the whole discussion in the case about all the money flowing through the NCAA, through the universities, and how surely Ed O'Bannon or you know, current day Jaleel Okafor must have some valuable intellectual intellectual property rights that he ought to grab back from Duke 
and NCAA doesn't really make a whole lot of sense if you're talking about a female cross-country runner. She's unlikely to be producing very much in the way of intellectual property, even even on a good day in court. I'm not sure you could pay her five thousand bucks. Maybe you could pay her five hundred or fifty, but um, you could distinguish between revenue sports and non-revenue sports. And I think you might run into a little buzzsaw with Title IX someplace, but I would have no trouble distinguishing revenue from non-revenue. Pay some of them five thousand, and some of them one thousand, some of them a buck and a quarter, and some of them nothing. It, 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 so that makes a lot of sense, right? There's not uh... Like there are NCAA basketball or football video games, we don't see you know, lacrosse video games. So you could argue certainly that uh, different revenue levels are being generated by different programs. Is that what you anticipate seeing then? Is that is that uh, programs are just going to kind of selectively pay again, assuming that Obama becomes law, are going to selectively p pay the IP rights into a fund for those sports? Do you? It, well, it's, it's just going to be a choice. You know, I've been a little bit surprised that, at least according to the press, most of the um, power conference schools seem to have immediately decided to pay their Olympic sports the same full cost of attendance scholarships that they're paying their their revenue sports. And I thought that might be a little bit of a debate on campus. So maybe I'm not a good judge of how tight the budgets are or how tough the PR impact would be of distinguishing one sport from another. So I'm not sure where to go with that, except since I don't really believe O'Bannon is going to get affirmed on the $5,000 a pop, and I think we're probably years away from ever having to really deal with that in, final, in a final stage. I'm having a little trouble trying to figure out how much they would pay soccer players or, or lacrosse players when I don't think they're going to pay anybody anything for a while. Sure. I think it's easier. I think the full cost of a tennis issue, it's a little bit easier to argue that whether you play basketball or soccer, you need some extra money for pizzas or, you know, to uh, uh, to, to buy a, a dress clothes or a suit or something yeah. along those lines. Uh, but but then the ar argument, you know, changes certainly when you think about the amount of revenues that those teams are bringing in. So and you by, mentioned by it. The way, Kev, by the way, Kevin, we missed one other yes, point, which is uh, once this case gets decided by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, presumably in, let's say, summer, early summer, the losing party has the right to take it to the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, the U.S. Supreme Court decided uh, in 1986 in uh, border regions of the of, uh, state of Oklahoma uh, versus NCAA, a case involving the NCAA. And they said in passing, of course, the players can't get paid. And the case was actually about television rights. It had nothing to do with the players getting paid. But you hear, you hear a lot about that from the NCAA's lawyers in this case. Uh, and I think you'll hear a lot about it if they do happen to lose this appeal. And I actually think it's the kind of case, you know, it's, it's one in 100, one in 500 to get to the Supreme Court with an ordinary case. It's not an ordinary case. If O'Bannon wins at the Court of Appeals particularly, uh, the NCAA has got a real shot of letting the Supreme Court take a look at NCAA antitrust issues for the first time in 30 years. So... You know, the day of judgment for the NCAA, if it comes out of the losing end of this appeal, may not be 2015. It may be 2017. That was going to be my next question. As you, you alluded to the time frame in which these these events might take place, certainly I don't want to get into the weeds of, you know, all the different hypothetical scenarios. But from a financial planning standpoint, if I'm an AD and I'm thinking about financial planning for this this change, uh, what's a ballpark time frame? Is it is it two to four years before you're going to have to start writing checks for IP rights? I mean, is it three to five? What What's your expected yeah, time frame? I mean, I, I think it is two to four years. Uh, but, but again, I'm struggling a little bit with having to write IP checks because I think it's never going to happen. Uh, but yeah, if it went if it went badly for you, it would be it would be two to four years, assuming you got a a stay of the order. Now, see, when when Judge Wilkin decided her case. She issued an injunction which said you have to stop doing this stuff. And then when they asked her to delay the effectiveness of her case so an appeal could be taken, she delayed it by one year, which gives everybody a free ride until essentially Labor Day. Um, if the case was decided unfavorably to the NCAA in summer, they would appeal to the Supreme Court and they would ask the Circuit Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court, each of them in order, in that order, to delay the effectiveness of the decision again. And they probably would, because if you think about it, Kevin, if you say to a court, this is a big, important, groundbreaking case, nobody knows how it's going to come out, and it's going to turn college sports upside down, let's not turn it upside down until we're sure we got to the end of the road. 
I think that's a pretty strong argument for uh, for a stay. So I, I think we are, you know, I, I think we've kind of bitten the bullet on full cost of attendance already, and I think we're we're two to four years away, absent you know an earthquake, an unusual event. Sure. Uh, two to four years away from having to. Uh, start writing checks to the players for their IP rights. So to your point, we've already kind of bitten the bullet on full cost of attendance. The, the, the real big variable, uh, potential elephant in the room, is the the IP rights. Again, I, I think a lot of our audience would hope that you're right uh, and that uh, the NCAA has a great case in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. But again, I think this hangout is really about hypotheticals and, and, and or not necessarily about hypotheticals, but helping ADs plan. And so let's hypothetically say that it does uh, become law, uh, and and I at Barefoot University have engaged you as a legal advisor to our athletic department uh, with O'Bannon as law. Um, what are the operational steps that I should take uh, if this ca if the case prevails? Do, you, do, I, do, I, do I need additional staffing? Is it do I need additional legal staffing? Is it purely an exercise of financial planning? How can I as an AD at at Barefoot University be more prepared, less reactionary? You know, I've never worked in an athletic department, so I'm a little out of my league, but let me try it anyway. I don't think you need any more staffing. I think you need a clear understanding of the governance structure of the university and who is one, who needs to be involved before some of these decisions are made. Let's take the simpler issue like full cost of attendance. So you've now got a, a ruling which says the NCAA has to permit you to go up to full cost of attendance on any athletic scholarship. Your basketball coach says, we're going, Kevin. If we don't go to full cost of attendance, we're not going to be able to make the March Madness. The football coach says the same thing. And now the university has to decide what to do for soccer players, cross-country runners, and, and wrestlers, including female athletes. I think the most important thing in terms of getting ready is to understand um, who at the university needs to be consulted on that decision before the decision is made? Is it the president's office? Is it the dean's office? Is it the, you know, gender equity uh, guy or gal? Is it only the athletic people, which we know it probably isn't only the athletic people? Who do you suggest might, it is? You might, you might be forced. You might be forced to make a quick decision as to as to whether to share this new bounty with other student athletes. And you're going to have a lot of people on campus who have an opinion, and their opinions aren't going to all be the same, from the budget people to the gender equity people to the athletic coaches. So I think what you need is to start talking about that in advance of having to do it and be sure you understand what Barefoot University would do uh, in the case if the case comes out the wrong way. And, and who would you advise that whose opinions you maybe should should matter the most? You know, If you're counseling me as an athletic director, who who do you who would you suggest that I think about aligning myself with for the for the betterment of the athletic department? Well, I I think the most important thing is to is to reach a consensus or as close to it as you can. So I think the important thing is everybody to be heard. I think you you can tell the dean of students that he or she is wrong uh, once you've listened to him. And the same thing is is with you know the Title IX people. You need to hear them out and be sure you understand them and be sure that the legal counsel to the university agrees that what you do is legal. And I think where you run into trouble is where you leave some people out of it, where the you know the football coach and the uh, provost of the university decide they can make a decision, and a lot of other people wish that they have been uh, they have been heard. But I, I don't know who you align yourself with. These are tough uh, these are tough calls. There is one other thing that the university has to do as an institution, Kevin. If, if I can go off in another direction, sure. And that's that's to be sure that they understand again what we said earlier about each school making its own decisions on these things. If you are not going to go to full cost of attendance for any scholarship athletes, or you are not going to go to the $5,000 a pop four years from now when the roof caves in and all my predictions are wrong, you've got to not go there unilaterally for your university. And you cannot have your soccer coach stand up at a meeting of soccer coaches, league soccer coaches, regional soccer coaches, and say, Hey guys, we're not paying full cost of attendance at our school. We don't think you need to do that for soccer, and we hope you don't do it either. That that's a very bad thing to do. You're going to be immediately in trouble with the law. So collusion, barefoot, correct? Collusion. Barefoot University has got to make its decision. There there should not be league rules on this stuff, and uh, there there you know the NCAA rules will be will be set 
by the order of the court, but you don't want the leagues or individual teams in the leagues to be uh, going right back and setting you up for yet another round of litigation. So two things I like about what you just said. Number one is that uh, you know no matter what happens, it would be savvy as an athletic director if I were to involve all the constituent groups and at least hear them out. Uh, because telling them no will be easier if I've at least heard their opinion first. Uh, I think that's uh, a savvy, uh, a sound approach. And then two, you, you need to instruct and counsel your coaches and members of your athletic department that once we make this decision, this is our decision, and we should not try to impact or influence any other schools uh, in our peer group. Right, exactly right. And, you know, so, go back to the first point again. It's not just you want to hear them out. They're going to get some of the complaints. If you don't, if you don't pay full cost of attendance to, uh, you know, the young lady running cross country, her dad's going to call the college president, complain to him, not the athletic director and not the coach, and the college president better be prepared to answer the questions and say, yes, sir, I understand your problem, and no, sir, we couldn't afford that, and we thought carefully about it, and this is what we're doing. So you've got to get buy-in across the campus because the complaints are going to come from every direction if you don't go full boat for everybody. So we got an audience question here. Uh, we, we've talked about already that there's overlap with the, the new autonomy governance structure uh, in the O'Bannon case because the O'Bannon case includes full cost of attendance, and that's largely what was just passed in the new, uh, new governance structure. Uh, the question from the audience is, do you see any antitrust issues uh, in, in the overall autonomy model where the 65 largest programs are passing rules that will significantly impact the ability of remaining Division One schools to compete. So are there any antitrust issues with what's already been passed, not what's coming down the road? I don't if I understand them correctly, I don't think so. I think if you every time you you um, move the ceiling up, you're probably avoiding antitrust problems. If you move the ceiling up from from grant and aid to full cost of attendance, and if the schools don't collude, I think you're uh, you're getting safer and safer in the antitrust area. Because remember, what the plaintiffs want in these cases is let every school make its own decision, right? Roy Williams wants to pay full cost of attendance. Coach K can play, pay double full cost of attendance. Now, you can't do that under NCAA rules, but that's their model. So the higher up you go, the safer, the safer you are. Nobody complains if scholarships are too big. I think that the spin of the question was that what the Big Five conferences are doing is affecting uh, negatively, the other conferences, what we used to call the mid-majors, I don't know what we call them right now, and I'm not sure how it's negatively affecting them because, again, being an outsider a little bit to the business, I thought they were all entitled essentially to say me too and offer their athletes the same, the same opportunities. So I don't think there's really an antitrust uh, issue there unless I'm missing something. No, I think, I think you answered the question. There's not an antitrust issue. It, 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 I think it's the Maybe the answer to the question is just that it's just a continuing, maybe widening of the gap between what the Power Five are able to offer and what what others are. I, I, um, do, I do think if the mid if the mid majors are going to decide to stay to stay low as a group, they create their own antitrust headache, and if the NCAA blesses it, they create another antitrust headache for themselves. And again, you know, the, the simplest way to stay out of antitrust trouble is to give everybody as much flexibility as you can consistent with an amateurism principle you can defend. So uh, scholarships, if your position is full cost of attendance is all we're doing, then just stick with it and let every college make its own decision. And uh, you should be out of trouble. But when you start saying, well, no, the mid-majors should do less, you start, start to get into trouble. So uh, That's an interesting statement. How, so, so to avoid that type of trouble, what should non-Power 5 programs not do? It, it, well, again, it, it sounds like it gets back to this collusion issue, but it does how, can, how can mid-majors avoid ups, uh, uh, missteps is the question. Well, it gets, back to, it, it gets right back to the collusion issue. They've got to make their own decisions. They should not be part of any conference or other discussion that we can't afford that, we're not going to pay that. Can't afford it is not a defense to antitrust. Amateurism is a defense to antitrust because your position is we're creating the product. Our product is amateur is amateur sports, but I think it's a tough sell to say our product is grant and aid sports. So, for example, I mean the the, uh, the Ivy League could get sued over failing to pay athletic scholarships and have to explain why why they don't. They, you know they they uh, 
They haven't yet, but it it could happen. So the free market is what is what the antitrust laws are are designed to protect. So the question is, well, how do you have a free market in uh, in college athletics? I'll give you I'll give you another example: four-year scholarships. I thought the NCA was a sitting duck on the four-year scholarship cases for years, and they managed to avoid getting clobbered. And now that's changed. But to have a rule that you know. UCLA can't give a football player out here in my backyard a four-year commitment on a scholarship in order for UCLA to outcompete USC for that kid's talent. Really, it doesn't make any sense, and because you're you're limiting your ability to compete effectively in offering a college education to the kid. So it's those kinds of rules that get you in trouble. Uh, a comment from the audience, and, and, and also my sense is that there, there are a lot of conferences and, and schools uh, are, are, that are, as a group, to kind of talking about maybe not what they should do as a group, but at least talking about as a group what they're going to do. Um, and the audience question is, are you saying that a conference deciding these issues as a group is illegal? It's, it's illegal to decide as a group, but it's not illegal to discuss as a group. Is that, is that what you're saying? It's a very hard question. Um, let, me, let me explain this the way I explain it to my students in my sports and the law class. I start them on day one, and I try to explain why, why we have a course on sports and the law, why we don't just teach them law and have them apply it to the sports business like they would apply it to the software business or the manufacturing business. So I ask them whether the San Diego Chargers or the Oakland Ra and the Oakland Raiders are competitors or business partners. So we could ask the same question about Kansas and Kansas State, right? Are they competitors or business partners? And the obvious answer, if you if your audience is sophisticated at all, is they're a little bit of both. They're kind of competitors. They're competing for players. They compete for coaches. They compete for ticket sales. And they compete for sponsors. And they're kind of business partners because they work together to try to create the best possible product and generate the most TV dollars and all that. And this creates confusion under the antitrust laws. So, you know, if your people in your audience work for Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, and they said, can we have a meeting and discuss prices, I would say, hell no. <laughs> uh, they, they can't agree on prices, but they shouldn't even be having a meeting. But I can't say that to, to you know, the NCAA. They have a lot of stuff they have to talk about. It's a different it's animal. Hybrid. It's a different animal. It's a hybrid. So, you know, I, I know this is being battled on some campuses, so it's a very good question. And I guess I'd put it this way. I think as a matter of antitrust law, pure law, not careful business advice, you can talk, but you can't agree on limits that are tighter than the NCAA's limits. That's why I think a conference can't agree to limit scholarships below full cost of attendance. And if the, and if the $5,000 a pop rule survived, the ACC couldn't agree, we're only going to $3,000. Duke could agree, NC State could agree, not with each other and not with a full conference. So you can talk and you can't agree. Now, the last point I'll make on this and then I'll stop is some people are going to say, don't talk. Because if you talk, you're going to end up agreeing. If you end up agreeing, we're going to be in trouble. And I know there are people out there giving advice to athletic departments now. Don't even talk about this stuff. And I think that's a hard way to do business, but it certainly is quite safe. Excellent, excellent. It, now, another big case that's on the radar of many athletic leaders right now is the Northwest Northwestern University Players Union appeal. I recognize you're an antitrust guy as opposed to a labor expert. Uh, do you have any opinion about what will happen there, why, and when? Uh, when, I don't know, because people were convinced it would happen a couple of months ago because some uh, uh, commissioners on the NLRB were getting – were giving up their jobs and moving on, and they thought they would decide it before they left. So they missed that guess. Next, I don't know what the next, the next. It should happen in the next six months. It probably should happen tomorrow. I think it's overdue. But once something is overdue, it's kind of hard to predict when it's coming in. Yep. Um, how will it come out? Um, you know, I guess 50-50 would be a cop out, but I think it is somewhere, somewhere in the range of 50-50 or a little better on the on the university side of surviving that. But you have to remember, they chose, you know, they chose Northwestern for a reason, which is that it's a private institution, so it's governed by federal labor law. If you're at the University of Alabama, 
uh, if your students say that they're employees, they're state employees, and if they're state employees, their rights are governed by Alabama law, and the law in many states is much less friendly to unions, particularly south of the Mason-Dixon line, than the federal law. So you know, organizing Ohio State, Michigan State, Michigan, and Wisconsin is going to be way harder than organizing Northwestern. So what do you bargain for if you're the Northwestern athletic director you sit down with the union? You had a union. They win. They have a union. They sit down and ask, what are they going to ask for? Anything they ask for that's prohibited by NCAA rules or Big Ten rules, you say, sorry, can't help you. So it's kind of a symbolic act, I think. Got it. So, so it sounds like not nearly the kind of direct and, and seismic implications of O'Bannon, but but something to keep an eye on. I, a similar question to what I asked you earlier: If the Northwestern Players Union appeal prevails, you know, <laughs> operationally at Barefoot University, and let's just say that that Barefoot University is a private institution, um, where this could kind of end up in my lap, uh, like other private schools, uh, are there any things that I should be, you know? operational uh, steps that I should take? How should I prepare for that type of ruling as a private institution? Well, if, if you read the decision of the, the essentially the equivalent of the trial judge, he's not really a judge, he's a commissioner, but the trial, whatever he is in Chicago, he was upset at several things at Northwestern. One was the number of hours they spent in practice. Uh, one was the, the assertion by the quarterback who's kind of leader of the pack there that he wanted to go to medical school and be a pre-med and they told him he couldn't major in in uh, pre-med or biology or whatever because it was too much work and too many labs. I mean, there, there were a lot of things asserted in that case, which, if true, made Northwestern's case look a lot worse than you would hope it would look if you were the athletic director at Northwestern. Maybe those things aren't true, but I think the more you treat your student athletes like students, the more likely you are to survive Northwestern, and, and the more they, they look a whole lot more like the Chicago Bears, the, the more trouble you're going to have. The other looming uh, case on the horizon is related to the possibility of free market system for players, you know, whereby they can earn unlimited compensation compensation uh, based on their marketability, commonly referred to and referenced, you know, as the Kessler case, Jenkins, you know, they, these a lot of these cases are referred to by name. Right. Uh, in your recent Sports Business Journal article, you write, "quote market based." individually negotiated salaries are not very likely in the foreseeable future, end quote. Uh, what are your thoughts on Jenkins? It's obviously really early. Is it too early to make predictions? It, it, yes and no. It's too early to make predictions. It's too early to worry about it because it is several years off. Um, but for those of you who don't know the case, the Jenkins case, also known as the Kessler case because it's brought by well-known sports antitrust lawyer Jeff Kessler, who represents most of the uh, professional uh, ballplayer unions, um, is in very early stages. It's two or three years away from being over, even at the trial level. But uh, I, the reason I think the case doesn't have much in the way of legs is that the O'Bannon case was brought before Claudia Wilkin, who's considered a pretty liberal, open-minded judge, uh, more siding with the ballplayers than, than the institutions. And her view of the case was, I'm not going to pay these guys big money. I'm not going to turn them into professionals. I'm not going to have more money going to the quarterback than going to the offensive tackle. If you read her opinion, at every opportunity, she says, they're not asking for a lot of money. They're not asking for competitive salaries. They're not asking for variable salaries by position. They're just asking for full cost of attendance and a few thousand bucks. And I think that's still amateurism. Now, if that's where a liberal judge comes out, then how do you think you get to a win in a case which says, there are no limits that that if you're trying to if you're trying to recruit Johnny football out of high school you might have to pay him three hundred and fifty thousand dollars to get him to come to your university now I think Claudia Wilkin would she'd fall over dead if you told her that was the theory of the case in front of her and I think you're more likely to get a more conservative judge than that who will also be startled by it now I don't know you know I talked to Jay Billis about this he thinks Exactly the opposite. He's a pretty smart guy. You know, he's played some basketball, mm -hmm. graduated from law school, uh, an observer of the scene. He feels exactly the opposite way and that it's coming and the players are generating so much money for the universities that in the revenue sports, you've got to pay them something fair and something fair is six figures or more. So uh, 
I guess I could be wrong, but but when I read a judge who I who I know, known for years, and I consider to be you know, on the liberal side of the federal judiciary, and she's kind of turning away from pay for play. Now the O'Bannon plaintiffs are turning away from pay for play. In their appellate brief, they say five times, maybe more, this is not pay for play. This is a little bit of money for our intellectual property rights. So pay for play is a big jump, and it's going to take uh, a lot of chutzpah by a uh, trial judge, an appeals court judge, and it will go to the Supreme Court. If some judge orders pay for play unlimited, um, we'll hear about it from the nine guys and gals in the black robes in Washington, D.C. So I think it's it's years away, and it's it's a long shot. But uh, as I said, some pretty smart people disagree with me, so uh, take it with a grain of salt. Well, we we want to we want to thank you for your time today and appreciate your input to to kind of recap uh, on a really interesting conversation from somebody who knows a lot more about this than I do. Uh, to recap, you feel like that the the IP rights, the 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 cash with a go to players for IP rights is is more likely uh, to fail than than uh, than pass uh, during the appeal process, uh, and if uh, in the advance of uh, However, it shakes out in advance of that taking place. You would recommend that athletic directors uh, hear the voices of the folks in their community uh, to prepare for that uh, decision-making process, and don't have conversations, or, or certainly don't agree uh, with your with your peer group about what you're going to do in terms of full cost of attendance um, or the IP money. Correct. <laughs> is there anything else that you'd like to add, Lynn, today as, as we, as we uh, get you out of here? Is there anything else that you want to throw in there, uh, pragmatic advice for athletic administrators uh, about well, some of these issues? Well, you know, my pragmatic advice for the, for the athletic administrators is in their role as a, as a voting member of the NCAA. The NCAA has been held in very low regard by lawyers, judges, and professors of sports law. I mean, I go to conferences with hundreds of sports law professors that teach it at your institutions, large and small, and if you just go for a show of hands, uh, they don't like the way the NCAA has been governed over the last 20 years. And I think you make yourself a sitting duck for litigation when you create rules like a no four-year scholarship rule or very tough transfer rules or whatever else we're fighting about. So a little common sense goes a long way here. When you get in the fight of your life over the Kessler case, you kind of would prefer to be in a, in a milieu of judges and observers and newspaper writers who all think the NCAA is doing a pretty good job. What you have now is, is a lot of people like me who think the NCAA creates a damn good product. They love to watch the games, but they think a lot of the decisions made are, are inconsistent or picky -yoon or what or what have you. So, you know, to the extent you get a vote, uh, just push for logical, commonsensical, uh, student-athlete friendly uh, decision making, and I think you got a much better chance of surviving the uh, cauldron of the uh, antitrust and other litigation. The recent article is uh, the demise of the NCAA. The demise of NCAA amateurism is greatly overstated. It's a great read on Sports Business Journal. Uh, Lynn Simon, I want to thank you for joining us today and appreciate your time. I hope you have a great rest of the week out there in sunny San Diego. I'm going to be shoveling my driveway later this evening. I hope. <laughs> All right. Thanks for thanks very much, Kevin. I'll come back anytime you like. All right. Thanks so much, Lynn. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Take care.